Um, I put a little note here and I said satire is a very effective tool and you use it well. Shakespeare in his play King Lear said that he had the king to say that devil humour because humour is a very effective politically and kings are being attacked via humour and if they did it in any other way they'd be put in shock. Right. So uh, you're an action painter. But not in a normal art world sense, New York, action painters in New York, right? But your work is all about action. And you, you're, you, you're painting narratives about action. Your work's full of energy, action depicting everyday life, events and gatherings of people, mostly engaging in action. So my question is, how did you arrive at this juncture? Did you have an early beginnings? Well, in terms of starting out in the very beginning, of course, I went through a bunch of different things. Uh, you know, tried to be Chris Burden for a little while. That didn't work, but it was fun. Um, and then with this body of work in particular, there were actually, I want to say, three deviations or iterations of it. Yeah. At least two before I came on to this in particular. Yeah. And it was one of those things where... I have to say that while I was happy with the ideas and what was motivating the paintings, visually I wasn't happy with the, the way the paintings looked, the actual outcome of them. Oh, okay. And it was one of those things of uh, sometimes I have this voice that pops in my head and says, okay, you're back in college, you're a sophomore, ju a junior, sort of midway through college, and someone tells you, in 20 years, these are the paintings you're going to be making. How do you feel? Yeah. And with the first two, three iterations of this, I thought, what happened to me? I had so much promise. <laughs> you know. And then I finally got to a point where I was able to work with the idea. and with the Because I think a lot of it was how to deal with the figure, honestly. For a long time, I hadn't dealt with the figure. And, and that came through, uh, honestly, the way I was taught in undergraduate. It was very um, sort of anti-figural at the time, um, not only in terms of the sort of traditional movements that people think about with action painting and whatnot, but also in, at Brown in 1986, it was, well, you painted a man there. Uh, why is it a white man? Why isn't it a woman? It was, it was a lot of the socio-political stuff that people are working with now, yeah. you know, to a very large degree was going on back then. And I felt like I had to have an answer for everything. And that just stifled me. And so forever I didn't work with the figure. And then when I first started getting back into it, it was trying to become comfortable with that. And what is it that I wanted out of the figure? Yeah. So That thing about abstraction, because I, I, I've probably always been a narrative, figurative painter. Right. But I did have a little spell early on where I did. did they, they were abstract, but they were pop abstraction, as mm -hmm. it were. And in recently, in an art group, uh, in an interview, someone said, well, you know, you're, you're a very storytelling, narrative, figurative painter. Do you like abstract art? And I said, yes, I love it. Mm -hmm. I love abstract art. But I can't make it because I don't have the passion. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you could like something, but I, I couldn't think of doing mm -hmm. it. I mean, I, and I understand vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, what? There's so, been, just along those lines, yeah. there's been times where... You, you look back on the artists that have influenced you, and especially yeah. coming up with a healthy education of modernism, there's normally that point where the artist makes the breakthrough, and they leave representation and figuration behind, and they're off into the abstract world, and yeah. it's this glorious celebratory moment. And there have been times where I thought, when, when's that time coming for me? <laughs> you know? And uh, there's been times where I've tried to force it, saying, okay, I'm going to be an abstract painter now. And... Like you said, the majority of the paintings that I have hanging up in my house that I've either bought or traded with friends are abstract paintings. Oh, I absolutely yeah. love abstract painting, but when I tried to do it myself and where my passions lie, yeah. there just wasn't enough meat on the bones. Yeah. I needed people doing debaucherous or joyous things. Yeah. I needed that narrative, you yeah. know, that yeah, sort of... Good. I have another question for you, but I'll just phrase it in two lines first. Um, it seems to me that some of your works have a very de defined and definite structure. Mm. Oh, and others, totally different, very purposely chaotic, mm. in chaos. Um, 
appropriate to the subject matter you're doing, of course. Can you say anything about this, how you structure work and how, you know, the different things come in, how you think about the energy and the, how you lay out a work of art or anything? Is there any, maybe there's not, just it comes just naturally. In. Actually, no. <laughs> there's a lot of layout that okay. takes place. And, yeah. okay. uh, before we started, uh, Barrett was wondering what was going on in the studio right now. Yeah. And in the back room, I have a piece that I'm laying out, which has a very overall chaotic quality to it. Yeah. But it's uh, I'm drawing it out first because there's this element when I'm doing it of I'm putting something in, I'm stepping back, I'm looking how it relates to every, everything else. No, this element's too small, it needs to be bigger, and it needs yeah. to be over here. So within the chaos, there is a certain construction that occurs. Yeah. Uh, and I think I learned a lot from Bruegel in that mm -hmm. way. Um, he was one of those artists that when I was taking art history classes, I always understood him, I answered the questions right on the essays and whatnot, you know, in the exams. And the way he's able to orchestrate these mass movements of people, yeah. but then when you get into the specifics of it, there's still an important narrative. There's mm -hmm. still something that grabs the eye with each. Yeah. There's all these tiny little stories that he's able to convey while at the same time having this overall mass energy going yeah. on. And that was very influential. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, I've got another question. Um, num number three is embedded in your narrative work, is a nod to public culture. That is, I think when I look at them, I see references to films and comics and newspaper headlines. Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts about that connection and how much do you grab from that and how, how do you feel? Film, and again going back to being very interested in narrative, is a huge, huge influence. Oh, yeah. um, and there's oftentimes references that maybe I only pick up yeah. in, in the paintings that are direct references to films. Yeah. Um, one in particular I always think of, have you ever seen that great Gene Hackman movie, The Conversation? Oh, I was thinking, is it about drugs? Is that it's one? the one where he's the person who spies on other people oh, and reports yeah. their yeah, sound. I, uh, I, I was thinking of the French Connection. Right, like that. right. And, that was a different and I think those were around the same time, though. Yeah, same yeah, era. It was very good, I love it. But there's a scene where he's in his apartment and he's realized that someone is bugging his apartment. Uh, so now the master bugger has been bugged. Uh, and it's this montage of him systematically destroying the apartment. I mean, ripping the drywall off. Yeah, you know, I that. The yeah bug. I do. That was great. Yeah. Yeah, and it that. ends with him sitting in the middle of his apartment in complete rubble, just playing yeah. saxophone yeah. and defeated because he yeah. couldn't find the bus. That's right at the end, isn't it? I think that, yeah, that might actually be the last shot of the movie. Um, but there's a, a building painting I made, and in one of the rooms, there's someone just manically ripping the room apart. And it was a direct nod to, oh, to, to that scene yeah, yeah. You know, with Gene Hackman. Yeah. Um, and then growing up, in certain respects, a lot of my first sort of exposure to what I would think of as art or storytelling were comic books. Yeah. You know, they were very big influence. Yeah. Um, and specifically as time went on, and I have to admit it was through reading on Philip Gustin and wanting to know who his influences were, and uh, I kept noticing that George Harriman's Crazy Cat kept coming up, oh, yeah. and I did a very deep dive into to Harriman, and yeah. um, he, to this day, is a, a major influence. I mean, he's one of the few people, I think, who's working at a very high level in all aspects of what he's doing. Yeah. You know, as, a, as an artist, the way he lays out his comic pages is just stunning. I mean, they're, to me, up there with how Cezanne was able to compose an image within a frame. Yeah. And then while he's doing that, he's also playing with gender, he's playing with race, and then the way they talk, he's playing with language. The first few times you read a, a Crazy Cat comic, it's almost like reading another language. You have to read a couple of them to understand what's going on, yeah. you know? Um, and then, of course, going back to what you said in the beginning, there's always that healthy dose of humor in there. Yeah. And I've always loved humor as a tonic as a way of maybe disarming the viewer versus trying to shove something down their throat. You know, if you, if you approach a subject but with a wink, you got a better chance of maybe paying attention. Well, it's an access point for the public. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was thinking there was one thing about postmodernism, and I thought, hang on. 
this is not good, and it was the idea of must get rid of the aesthetic. Right. And if you get rid of the aesthetic, you get rid of one of the most powerful tools to get someone into a work of art. Right. And then after that, you've got them and they stay in. So um, I've got another question. Question number four is, uh, there's a noticeable shift in your smaller works and the portrayal of a single event. Mm -hmm. And those different works lead us to, com and then the, the more complex work lead us to contemplate your work almost in a mural fashion. Mm -hmm. So when you, your small painting sometimes deal with one single event. Mm -hmm. And then it seems to me that you, you, your work then moves into um, a way that the only way that the viewer can contemplate is, is like looking at a mural. So you're mm -hmm. telling a story not about one time, but it, it goes on. Because mm -hmm. it's purposeful or sort of... I think so. Um, no, I will say I know so. I think so seems <laughs> very yeah. not a little. Um, as this body of work has been developing for almost 10 years now, which is the longest I've ever stuck with anything. I mean, if it gets boring, I'll stop. But it seems I, I finally found this sort of endless yeah. field to run around. But with the the characters in the in the paintings, I do think of them as almost this really large theater group. And there are these archetypes, and folks will appear in multiple paintings, and sometimes they disappear, but then they come back five paintings later. Yeah. And oftentimes, if a particular uh, character or scenario really strikes a chord with me, then it's almost maybe thinking of it as a band. Do they get a solo album now? <laughs> you know, so like Snake Boy, for example, and this is an older painting, but Snake Boy was in a ton of paintings. And then uh, I decided I'd give him his own painting. And so then it almost becomes, uh, you know, a little moment to highlight that. You have all these uh, cross-references and Doubling, traveling inclusion. So it is this sort of, sort of continuing investigation of this very grand narrative, yeah. and then to see where it goes. And uh, I mean, one of the things that I enjoy about the larger ensemble pieces, each one of the actions that's going on are very isolated and unaware of the other ones that are happening around them. Uh, so another question: on, uh, I said here before you start a painting or drawing. How much have you formed about the event you're going to work on? And how much will you leave it open? So there's, it's obvious that these events, which are mm -hmm. everyday um, occurrences, mm -hmm. um, how much you know, do you work on that? And, and how open do you leave it? You know, you... I do tons and tons of drawing. Everything yeah. ends and begins with drawing with me. So yeah. normally, an idea has been worked out in one manner or another with drawing prior to the painting starting. Okay. Oftentimes, say if it's an ensemble piece, it may just be one or two of the isolated actions. Yeah. And I'll have these drawings laying around and I start thinking, oh, these three would be to get nice in an ensemble painting, a large group painting, what other groups are going to be in this? Do I want it to be a landscape? Do I want to have buildings involved? And, and then it starts to sort of cobble together in that way. There have also been times where I've done a drawing that happy with it just the way it is, and then thought, oh, will this translate nicely as a painting? Uh, and to this day, and you know, they always talk about this in, in undergrad and whatnot, that you almost become beholden to the drawing or the image you're working from, that the, the painting is always subservient to the drawing. And they say, well, just put the drawing away. And I can't tell you the number of times where I've come, put the drawing here on the table, face down, gone back into the working room, come and started three seconds later, I run back and I'm like, yeah, but what did I do? It was so good in the drawing. So then uh, what's also evolved with that, knowing that part of me is saying with the, with actually both of these, I did some very, very rough sketches, but then didn't allow myself to really flush it out because I wanted to be able to go into the painting and have the painting still be a painting in its own right. And so uh, I think it came to what you were saying, that I have the idea, I know a basic construction of the way it's going to go, but I want to leave it open enough that changes and things can pop up and I'm not, I'm not feeling like I'm just directly translating. So my last question was, what's next? 
more paints. <laughs> just yeah. keep working. I mean, it, it's uh, Bear and I were talking about this before you came by. I've, I've gotten to this point, knock on wood, that um, I wake up every morning, I exercise, I feed the cats, I come to the studio, I work, finish up, go home, eat dinner, go to bed, repeat. And uh, when these ideas started developing back in 2011, there, I, I hate for this to be so romantic, but I do think of myself as a romantic in terms of the um, genre, in terms of art, you know, which obviously expressionism is underneath the umbrella of romanticism. But I really, there was this moment as I was working through those first few deviations that we talked about earlier, where and it started to sort of come together and I was happy with the way I was working with the figure. And there was this moment I, uh, in the studio where I felt like I'd opened this door and there was this limitless green field before me. And I thought, oh, I can do this. If I do this, I do this. This will lead over here, but I'll come back to this later so I can go over there. And so now it's just the continual investigation. So. It's, um, in fact, it's what every single artist does you know, when they start a new work, a uh, new series of works. Am I going to continue what I was doing? Right. Am I going to continue with variations going another way? Right. Or am I going to do something totally different? So every artist, I right. think, fa faces that right. uh, dilemma and has to work it out before you yeah. finish that. For me, when I feel like things are going really well in the studio, while I'm working on a painting, based on what's happening in the painting, this voice pops in my head, excuse me, and says, oh, what if you did this? Oh, what if you tried this but did this instead? And then that becomes the next painting. Yeah. And then you're working on that painting, and ideally that painting gives you a question, which becomes the next painting. And so you just keep yeah. following the lead. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's the artist dilemma. Yeah. Do you want to stop there and see what we've got? I'll show you for you.